Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Some of you have likely heard me say that San Jose State is at the epicenter of the future. But we also know we're living through pivotal moments in history. And this moment, in t not just in politics, but in the entire American story. We find ourselves here in Silicon Valley embedded within a complex technological revolution. And we're going to be hearing about that over the next two days. There's undeniably this sense of change and uncertainty. This moment requires a lot of intentionality as we navigate the academic year, thinking about political and geopolitical issues. More than ever at San Jose State, we need to reframe our institutional role with a more closely coordinated shared narrative that supports our students and student development in this fast-paced world. Here at San Jose State, we've created a campus-wide framework called the Future of Humanity and Civic Engagement. It's, an, it's in our intentionality to sh and an initiative to really shape collective learning. We're looking to combine intentional sense-making with open dialogue across our community. We always want to reaffirm our commitment to teaching and learning about civic engagement. We want to ensure our campus is a space for free speech and free expression while also valuing diverse opinions. We don't all see and experience the world in the same way. We look to continue to blend the genius of our academic programs and all of our co-curricular experiences with a coordinated approach to ensure students and our community as a whole better understand and can navigate the tensions in our lives, our humanity, and our democracy. We have evidence of this every day. I'm grateful to our Dean of Undergraduate Education, Melinda Jackson, who's right here, for her leadership in this effort. I think many of our students know activism and advocacy are part of our DNA, and we're devoting a lot of time and effort towards a campus climate where everyone feels physically safe, free from harassment, and free to express their perspectives. As a community, we believe very strongly in inclusion and justice for all, and we try to live those values every single day. Freedom of speech is one of those core values. It is, as the Supreme Court has written, the indispensable condition of every other form of freedom. It's a pillar upholding the democratic process and protecting it is essential if we want to live in a society and on a campus that's fair and equitable and equal for everyone. Our campus commitment requires us to embrace these challenging moments and continue to strive for community and unity. We have the collective to further our campus climate and choose to find our commonalities and continue to build dialogue for our entire community. I look forward to the conversations over the next couple of days and we're very grateful to the Georgetown Project, a free speech project, as well as to the Knight Foundation, the Knight Rudder community for hosting this event on our campus. I'd like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Sandy Sugard, who will be leading the next couple of days to share a little bit about himself and the project. Come on up, Sandy. Welcome. Thank you very much, Cynthia, and thank you especially for the warm welcome we've had from San Jose State University, both in the planning process and actually the event that has arrived after six months of thinking and and uh, trying to make it as relevant and important discussion as possible. Um, uh, Cynthia asked me to, President Tenyenti Matson asked me just to say something about myself, uh, which is that I'm basically a, a journalist. Uh, I still haven't managed to put the word former behind the the word journalist, but I've been in academia for some time now. I was dean of the School of Communication at American University and then president of Goucher College in Baltimore, and I've been now at Georgetown University for 10 years. Um, and seven and a half of those 10 years have been spent developing the Free Speech Project, and our idea is to examine and document the condition of free speech and free expression around the United States uh, as c in as complex and yet understandable a way as possible. We have a free speech tracker online that has reached a thousand incidents that we've documented, 996 to be precise. And uh, we have some curriculum modules that we're uh, going to be pushing very hard and out there for uh, schools and colleges to use to study free speech and free expression issues 
not just a week in a survey course, but to pay more attention because we think they affect everybody, every place, all the time. So the, the, the latest initiative of ours is to do a series of uh, four symposia around the country, regional symposia on free speech issues, and uh, especially as they apply in different parts of the country. And w the way we've chosen places, which makes it a little bit easier, is they are all cities where the Knight Foundation, our funder, along with Georgetown University, where the Knight Foundation has regional offices. And why do they have a regional office in San Jose? Because it's one of the places where the Knight newspapers and the Knight Ritter newspapers, which eventually produced the endowment for the Knight Foundation, were particularly successful, and where the communities were, were a great place for the Knight and Knight Ritter newspapers to work. So that's why we're here. We were in St. Paul, Minnesota last year, which shares that status, and San Jose, San Jose this year, and who knows where next, but there's a, there are a few possibilities. Um, in our day and two-thirds, we're going to try to cover a lot of topics with some wonderful people who have given generously of their time to participate and uh, lead the discussion. So I want to introduce the panelists for the first, uh, for the first session and sit down with them for this conversation. We don't believe in opening statements at all. We will get right into the, to the conversation. Uh, starting from my right, Margaret Russell is uh, on the faculty of the Santa Clara University Law School since 1990. And uh, she is very much involved in issues of social justice and public service in that law school. And we're very privileged to have her with us and have her time today, too. Next in the seating order here is Eugene Volokh, who um, has taught at UCLA Law School for 30 years, Eugene? For, for 30 years and has just stepped down from there to be a fellow at the Hoover Institution at nearby Stanford University. He has a very rich and varied background and is quoted very often in debates about free speech. Uh, he was, uh, one, one thing that stands out in his bio for me is he was the law clerk to the great Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, whom I knew and respected greatly. And uh, she spoke when I was uh, president of Goucher College to a packed auditorium in a very memorable evening. Uh, I also don't want to fail to mention that uh, Eugene immigrated with his family from the Soviet Union at the age of seven, and uh, at the age of 15, he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Math and Computer Science from UCLA at, at the age of 15. Uh, that's impressive. It's a long time ago, too. Uh, Alex Samos, we're very grateful to have him here today. He is the Chief Information Security Officer at Sentinel One and has been involved in uh, uh, many high tech firms and setting of policy and discussion of some of these controversial issues. He's a lecturer in computer science and international policy at Stanford and uh, previously worked at Facebook and Yahoo, among, among other places. I'm going to, while still standing, I'm going to pose one question. Then I'm going to sit down, and the four of us are going to have a, a conversation. And I pose this question to all three of our panelists for a start. And that is um, uh, the, the topic of this particular session is the condition of free speech in America. So I want to ask um, all of you what your general observations are about how we stand on free speech in the midst of this presidential campaign at a, at a very sensitive time, very, some very controversial moments recently. But beyond that, is there a difference in Silicon Valley? Uh, does, free speech, does free speech look to be in a different condition? And we can broaden it from Silicon Valley to Bay Area, to Northern California, and even to the Pacific Northwest. Is there, 
Is there a major regional difference about about free, free speech? Working as I do in Washington, D.C., and living as I have in Washington for 55 years, um, I do have a, a, a regional, um, I don't know quite what, it's not, not, it's not a bias, but a, a regional sensibility that has been shaped by being there for so long. And that's part of the purpose of these symposia, is to take them around the country and see just how differently people feel. And uh, why don't we start first with uh, Eugene, your thoughts about that. Be sure to, you might want to take the next one, so Alex has one. Right. Uh, and, and we encourage people to, uh, if, if uh, so moved, to interrupt each other graciously and politely, civil dialogue, but this is not a this is not a, a, a formal sort of style of conversation. So, uh, couple, sure. So, a couple of observations about free speech and Silicon Valley. Um, one is that speech is vastly more free than it was, say, thirty years ago. Simply because it used to be that if you wanted to speak to a large audience, you had to either be very rich or have the ear of someone or some entity that's very rich, such as a newspaper. So a co you could be a columnist, uh, but, uh, or you could maybe buy ads uh, in them, but uh, if you're an ordinary person and you wanted to speak to a large audience, you had no chance of doing that. Uh, so the internet, and especially social media, has vastly increased people's ability to speak effectively. Um, now, one thing that I, so that's compared to 30 years ago. I'm not sure that's true compared to, say, 10 years ago. Because in the last 10 years, um, uh, various big tech entities, chiefly but not only social media platforms, have uh, uh, both as a result of their own decisions and as a result of some pressure uh, from others, have started imposing various viewpoint-based restrictions uh, on uh, what can be expressed on their platform. Maybe that's good. Uh, newspapers, for example, impose all sorts of restrictions on what is published there. I wouldn't want the government to be able to tell us what is and what is not misinformation. But if your newspaper does not do a good job of screening out misinformation, it's a bad newspaper. You wouldn't want to read it, right? One of the things that you seek from a newspaper is screening out for misinformation. So maybe that's good that social media platforms are doing the same, always recognizing that uh, Sometimes the people who say something is misinformation are themselves misinforming. And we've seen lots of examples of uh, uh, restrictions on supposed misinformation where it turns out that, uh, uh, that the supposed misinformation was either true, uh, e.g. the Hunter Biden laptop, or was at the very least uh, has become quite understood to be quite credible. Like, for example, claims that uh, COVID was the result of a Chinese lab leak were actually banned from uh, at least one social, I think, several, but at least one social media platform uh, when they were first uh, um, distributed. And then a year or two later, it was recognized that while we don't know for sure, that is actually a very reasonable theory that needs to be discussed with everything else. So let me just step back a bit from that. What we're seeing here, I think, is a um, latest iteration in what had been a recurring discussion about economic power being leveraged into political power, right? So here you have these, some of, them, some of the wealthiest companies in the world, some others maybe not quite as wealthy but still extremely powerful, often run by people who are extremely wealthy and extremely powerful, deciding what is and what is not going to be allowed. The one interesting thing is that the political valence on the question has flipped. It used to be it was mostly the left uh, who complained about uh, economic power being leveraged into political power, cases like Citizens United and such. Mostly the right who said, you know, we, are, uh, uh, we think it's fine when that happens. Now it's the right that's complaining. And the left who says, oh, no, 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 this is private property rights, right? This is, this is what should be happening. Um, so, and uh, uh, that's happening in social media. It's also happening in AI. Jacob Changama at the Vanderbilt University, there's this Future Free Speech Project, had uh, organized a report uh, through with his researchers uh, earlier this year, which reported that, say, generative AI companies, a considerable number of them would refuse to, for example, write 
write uh, uh, essays in response to a prompt, give me an argument, if I recall correctly, uh, in favor of abortion restrictions. They said, no, 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 we're not allowed to do that. What about an argument against abortion restrictions? Sure, here you go. Uh, and again, you know, that's private companies, private property. Maybe they should be perfectly free to have these kinds of restraints. But again, one interesting question is to what extent should such a really economically powerful technology companies be able to potentially influence public debate, especially as search is getting to be more and more an AI-focused, where people more and more, presumably when they're trying to decide how to vote, are going to be asking, um, uh, asking for AI answers to various questions. So those, it seems to me, are the things to think about. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for bringing up some issues that, uh, that I think are so important to discuss. A little bit of my background, since we're being locational and what difference does it mean to be in one part of the country for, for another, I grew up in Philadelphia and still very comfortable, I guess, with the what is DC world and Beltway world, but for the last... Um, part of my life, most of my life, I've been out here in California, first for law school, and then <clears throat> after a brief time living in the Midwest for a clerkship, 30 plus years, uh, teaching uh, at a place very close by, Santa Clara University, which is and has been branded for the last you know, number of years, the Jesuit University in Silicon Valley. And I, I just want to share briefly the, the perspective of someone who has seen Silicon Valley, uh, the real place, the geographical place, not just the metaphor, I guess, go from, um, it, it, not just go through an amazing transformation because of the presence of the companies, but go through an amazing transformation economically and in terms of wealth disparities. When I started on the... Sorry. Our first protester. That's quite all right. So um, I always thought I would not address my students or audiences by saying, well, when I first got here, but when I first got to um, Santa Clara University, the dean at the time said to me, I remember when this was all fruit orchards. And I thought, it's unbelievable. And now I have the opportunity to have seen Silicon Valley I live in the greater Bay Area, but to see Silicon Valley change so amazingly that uh, a recent study cited Santa Clara County as having the highest rate of homelessness, unhoused people in the country. And that's shocking uh, to live in a county that uh, has such disparities. How does this connect to freedom of speech? Well. You know, I'm an old-fashioned person, right, who goes back to first principles, I guess, and I think freedom of speech should be available to everyone. And one, um, one thing I appreciate very much about the transformation in Silicon Valley and social media is a certain democratization uh, that, is, that is very helpful for people to communicate their views. However, um, there is still the wealth disparity, and that comes out in ways that Professor Volokh mentioned. Um, campaign finance and campaign contributions are skyrocketing. Uh, I, um, well, I'll risk being booed for saying something that um, is partisan, but the, the billionaires in the Silicon Valley who are contributing to the candidate who does not support the Constitution um, trouble me because it makes me wonder why all of that money is going into some positions and an individual who so clearly does not respect freedom of speech in the Constitution. That really worries me. Why don't I stop there before I um, rile people up? Sure. So um, to answer that question, I should probably first explain why you have uh, 
a cybersecurity guy sitting with two distinguished law professors uh, on a free speech stage, right? Um, so, you know, when I was a little younger than you folks, and I was like a, a teenager in the 90s, I was doing things that weren't completely legal uh, with my computer, for which the statute of limitations has run out. Um, and then, uh, you know, I get to go uh, to uh, the big uh, sister university, to UCLA, uh, up here in the Bay, and do an electrical engineering degree and learn about security. And I, I spent my career in cybersecurity. Um, and then I got to- Her as an elderly sister. Yes, yeah, so, and you guys are paying us alimony now uh, for our football team, uh, which we do appreciate the $10 million a year. Um, that's going well since uh, we're 3-0 uh, now, uh, and you guys are getting your butts kicked. Anyway, um, so uh, anyway, uh, you know, so I get to work in cyber, and I, I've worked in cybersecurity, kind of hard cybersecurity, keeping people from hacking computers uh, and being a professional hacker myself, starting a company, hacking things, fixing things. Um, and then I became the, the chief information security officer, first at Yahoo and then at Facebook. And when you're a security officer at a company like that, a, 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 a social media company, you have the traditional cybersecurity protections, right? Like I was trying to keep Russia and China and Iran and a bunch of different financially motivated actors and a bunch of state actors from breaking into our systems and breaking into the computers of our customers. But we also had to protect our users from bad guys using our platform to cause harm. Um, and so I had a counterterrorism team. Uh, I had a child safety team that worked on sextortion and NCII, non-consensual Im intimate imagery, AKA revenge porn. Um, I had teams that did some really hard stuff. And one of the teams we had was a team that worked on government manipulation of the platform. Um, and so my team was the one that uh, investigated what Russia did in the 2016 election on Facebook, um, in which if you don't know, uh, actually did happen, uh, despite the denials of some folks that there were two different campaigns, at least uh, on this, there was a bunch of different things that happened, but on the social media side, there were at least two different campaigns by two different Russian groups uh, against the election. One, a pure play uh, social media campaign, one, a hack and leak scandal that used actual offensive capabilities out of the GRU, Russian military intelligence, against uh, the DNC and a variety of other folks, and then use the information they gathered through their cyber operations in disinformation campaigns. I'm saying all this because I totally agree with Eugene. F speech has never been freer from a practical perspective. Um, the fact that all of you are walking around with what is the equivalent of when I was your age, to have this capability, you would have had to own a satellite truck and a television station, right? So the fact that you've got in your pocket the ability to literally speak to millions of people at the same time is shocking. Like we didn't get jetpacks uh, and we didn't get robot helpers, um, but you got some pretty incredible capabilities that you totally take for granted that are honestly would be totally shocking to me uh, 20 or 30 years ago. That is incredible. But the flip side is it means that the structures we built around what is free speech and who gets to regulate speech Structures that were built in the printing press era for, you know, by the framers of the Constitution and here in the United States, and that then were reinterpreted for the radio era and the television era are now really hard to apply to the everybody is a satellite television station era, right? And so as a result, we have to have the people who build these tools and the platforms upon which the speech are amplified have to make speech decisions themselves at a speed and a scale that has never been foreseen from a legal perspective. Facebook makes tens of millions of speech decisions per hour of whether or not your content stays up. Um, we once estimated that in one hour we made more speech decisions than the entire US court system has made since the founding of the United States, right? And so, that is one of the things you have to keep in mind when we have this conversation, is one, the scope and the scale at which these companies operate dwarfs any kind of deliberative process that has ever existed in the history of mankind for making speech decisions. Second, 99.9% .9 of those decisions are non-controversial. The, the number one, by four orders of magnitude probably, speech decision is spam. The number one thing that has to be taken down off of any platform is spam. If you actually got a free speech platform, all it would be would be Viagra ads and porn. That is all it would be, right? I guarantee it. If you had a popular platform in which you could reach hundreds of millions of people and it had no filtering and a reverse chronological timeline, 
it would be completely and totally unusable. And so that's why none of those exist. If you're wondering why you have to have content moderation and why you have to have algorithms, it is not because Silicon Valley is full of evil people. It is not because we're all capitalists who, computer scientists who didn't take enough, so, you know, we didn't take enough English classes, which is like the theory of a number of folks. Um, it's because it's actually necessary because at the scale we're talking about, yes, you guys all have this power, but also bad actors have that power. And the majority of those bad actors are just trying to make money. But some of them want to manipulate our elections. Some of them want to sexually abuse children. Some of them want to plan terrorist attacks. And so as a result, you end up with private companies having to take actions that used to be the domain of governments without the political legitimacy, without the history, without the structures in place. And we're all living through the beginning throes of this situation as us nerds try to figure out how to do that. You know, hearing these various descriptions uh, makes me go to this contrast between how social media are seen out there in the country, and especially on the East Coast, as if everything is intentional, everything has been thought through uh, by a, a powerful... I think someone's trying to get you. Different, right? Thank you, Nina. I no, think you I were just censored, you. Sandy. I think you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. Uh, did, did you hear the first part of what I was, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Well, so I think that in Washington and in, in other power centers, if you want to call them that, on the East Coast especially, there is an assumption that everything that happens on social media, not everything, but that a lot of it is sort of planned, that, that that people are sitting in meetings and deciding, well, we will moderate this content, but we won't moderate that content. We will, and 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 then from time to time, those people get called before congressional hearings in Washington to see just how rude members of Congress can be, and and berate them and have the audience stacked with people who may have legitimate complaints about this about the social media and uh, so I think the there is at least a possibility that however this election turns out in six weeks or very soon that there's going to be some move from one side or the other to fix this to, to make to create greater accountability uh, if that were You're right. Kamala Harris has talked about weakening Section 230. Donald Trump has threatened Mark Zuckerberg with being imprisoned and uh, executed for treason. So you're right. Both sides uh, have an opinion on this. Right. There are many fine people on both sides, as, uh, well, as, uh, to be Don fair, as Donald uh, Trump once said. To be fair, we had four years of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, I think it had its pluses, it had its minuses. Um, nobody got executed uh, for, at least for speech. Uh, uh, Trump says all sorts of ridiculous things. I'm certainly no fan of him. Uh, but I do think we, we have a little bit of, of data on this. And I, I, I don't think that uh, free speech is going to be particularly threatened in a Trump 2 presidency, if there is a Trump 2 presidency, just as it really wasn't that threatened in the Trump 1. I'm not sure. I, go ahead, Margaret. Um, so I started us down this road of mentioning names, so I'm going to apologize and say something else. <laughs> No, I, I, um, I think this is very insightful, and I can't imagine having to make the decisions that a content moderator makes. This is working, true? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So, um, so yes, I think the election is on everybody's minds. Um, I do want to mention that this is a living issue that the United States Supreme Court decided a case this summer, which was sending a cases back down, deciding not to decide, but it does have to do with government um, regulation and I think incursions on uh, the power of content moderators. I would much rather have um, private content moderators make these decisions than the government because at least as, as far as I have seen, um, it, it works better than having the government control those decisions. Right, but I take it there's also an option of reducing the amount, certainly not eliminating. You're absolutely right about spam. 
that there need to be some restrictions on that. And by the way, just like there are some restrictions on uh, phone spam, or at least attempts at restrictions on phone spam. But at the same time, we don't really expect phone companies to say, oh, you know, we just don't like your organization's views. You are the KKK or you're the Communist Party, and we're against those views, so we're just going to cancel your phone line, right? Uh, that actually would be illegal for phone companies to do that because they're so-called common carriers. Uh, likewise, UPS and FedEx can't say, well, we just refuse to deliver books from the <laughs> socialist bookstore. Because, you know, we're capitalists and we don't go with this socialist nonsense. Uh, they can't do that, right? Now, interestingly, email companies are not thus constrained. Email companies could if they wanted to, and some of the terms of service suggest that they might, say, you know, we refuse to allow our email to be used for distributing racist or anti-trans or pro-terrorist or, or anti-government or whatever else uh, uh, messages. Uh, but, uh, but they don't, and I think we probably are happy they don't, even though we do think it's important that they try to filter out spam. So, so maybe there's a distinction between viewpoint-based actions by some of these uh, uh, entities and viewpoint-neutral actions that are necessarily going to be blocking something. Again, spam is an example. Maybe revenge porn and other such things, uh, uh, things as well. So there is this alternative. Now, the Supreme Court, I think, correctly said that when it comes to like the news feed, the Facebook news feed, that's something where that's a selection mechanism, necessary selection mechanism, just like the front page of a newspaper, where there ought to be some, uh, uh, some uh, editorial discretion. But as to other things, at least one possibility is to say, this shouldn't be for the government to regulate. This shouldn't be for private entities to regulate. This is something that, uh, uh, that uh, users should be free to decide for themselves. OK, so I agree that there are situations in which the companies have overstepped. And a number of the cases, like the 100 Biden laptop, I think mm -hmm. is a situation. But first, we have to put that in context. The GRU really did mm -hmm. hack a bunch of information. This has been denied by a number of people. But hopefully, we all agree. The GRU really did hack a bunch of information and release it um, first in the US campaign in 2016. And then they tried the same thing in 2017 in France uh, with Macron. Didn't work out that time. Um, the Iranians are trying the same thing now against Trump. So this has become a bipartisan issue. This should not, hopefully, one of the, the my, th something that makes me very upset about this whole thing is that election integrity and foreign interference in elections has become a partisan topic, and it should not be. Because the truth is, is just going for the rest of our lives, for the rest of your lives, which will be longer than ours, um, people are going to try to hack American campaigns, right? There are a bunch of authoritarian enemies of democracy, and cyber is a fantastic both offensive cyber operations and influence operations give them the ability to influence U.S. elections in a way they have never had in history. The KGB wishes that they could do this in the 1960s. And so this will never end. But it's not just going to be Russia. Russia was the big player in, in 2016, but there's this history of cyber operations where a big country does something spectacular, and then everybody copies this. We saw this with the Aurora attacks of China in 20, 2009. We saw this with the Snowden disclosures in 2013, Stuxnet. Everybody likes to copy it. And what the Russians did in 2016, China and Iran are copying. And China and Iran have different geostrategic interests than Russia. And so they are coming down on a different side. And Iran is coming down against Donald Trump. And they are trying to pull the GRU playbook against him. So the Hunter Biden laptop decision, I think, was the incorrect decision. But I want to make it clear. One, you all know about Hunter Biden's laptop. Every single one of you does. So the idea that that had any actual impact on the, the dissemination of that knowledge is just false. Two, Twitter banned like a URL for 48 hours. Facebook put a label on it. So you're not talking about some kind of Chinese style censorship campaign. And this has turned into a massive cause celeb on the right. And I think it was the wrong decision. It was the wrong decision because the platforms themselves were trying to prevent a GRU style attack. But from my perspective, they did not have the information appropriate to make that decision. And the difference between that and what happened partially with the GRU was this was a decision that was made by the New York Post to publish a story. They were the ones who could authenticate or not the information that was given to them. It was their editorial responsibility to do so. That should have been Facebook and Twitter should have said, okay, it's the Post's responsibility, right? Now, if somebody just creates immediately a fake account from Iran on Facebook right now and says, here are internal documents from Donald Trump's campaign, I think it's totally appropriate for Facebook to say, no, you're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed because we are the, pub the first publisher. If the New York Times decides to publish information they got from Iran, 
then that is the New York Times' responsibility, right? And I think that, that, was, that is a great example of, of overstep. But this is where it gets difficult here. And I think there is a level of responsibility the platforms have to make. And the idea that that has any kind of bearing, I think is a little ridiculous. And back to the Trump 2.0, we had this whole court case that a lot of people were very angry about, about I think totally inappropriate emails from the Biden White House during COVID. The idea that those emails are inappropriate, but legal actual threats to arrest a member of the CEO of a company and have him executed, I would say that that is above the Bantam book standard and that that should be considered unconstitutional. That that is unconstitutional pressure upon a member. And I think that that should be, whether or not he is serious or not, that that has a real impact on speech decisions. I think it is totally inappropriate for any candidate or member of government to be making actual threats of arrest in the United States for um, um, somebody who works at these companies. Alex, two clarifications. Not everyone in the room necessarily knows that the GRU that you're referring to is a Russian military Yeah, so there's, there's three major agencies. Russian intelligence agencies. SF, FSB and SVR come out of the KGB. Um, and uh, SVR is like the foreign intelligence. FSB is, is domestic as well as the former Soviet states. So they're focused in their near term. GRU is Russian military intelligence. Right. Yeah, I, I, I'd just like you to explain a little bit more about the case that you were just citing when you said there was a threat of arrest by... Donald Trump against... So Bantam Books, I'll, I'll let the law professors talk about that, but there was a, a big Supreme Court case this summer right. that a lot of it was about the Biden administration sending, you know, talking about COVID, which I think things were certainly... There is both the appropriate thing is for a politician to say, I don't like what I saw online, which happens all the time. Sure. And that's completely bipartisan. The number of things you hear from everybody, you know, like you said, members of Congress love to pull these CEO, CEOs up and say dumb things, but also just to express that they, they saw stuff they don't like online. Right. But to make specific threats of, if you don't do X, I will do Y, is generally so, considered So it was Donald Trump who was making right. that threat. Well, there's, yes, but, but, but the, the case Biden was about the Biden administration. Yeah. The Biden administration was trying to do something about what it saw as misinformation, disinformation online about COVID. Yes. And about vaccines. And and that has quite a lot of people upset that 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 they were trying to control the dialogue, people would say, mm -hmm. by questioning and to some extent threatening. People right. And what I'm saying is there's a bunch of different programs that I think Generally, for you know the National Science Foundation or the for the Surgeon General to say, I think this is the information that should be out there. I think is totally appropriate. Right. There was a specific threat from a, somebody who worked at the White House of if you don't do this, we right. have to rethink helping you out on something. And there's a specific Supreme Court case about you can't threaten right. somebody. Right. Right. So so go ahead, Eugene. I'll come back to my question. So in a so actually, so I think that what Alex identifies is very important. There's actually a case from last term that was not as much noticed for, for correct reasons, but that is, to that is very much on point. As it happens, I was counsel of record uh, for the petitioners there, but, um, uh, but I think I can objectively describe it. The case is NRA v. Vulo, and the NRA sued Maria Vulo and Andrew Cuomo. Uh, uh, Cuomo was the governor of New York, and uh, Maria Vulo was, the, was his appointee, who was the head of financial regulatory. Um, uh, uh, organization of, for New York State. Um, and the allegations, at this point it's all allegations, the procedural posture is nothing's been proven yet. The question is whether on these factual allegations there's a legal potential claim. Um, uh, so NRA alleges that Vulu and Cuomo pressured through threats of enforcement, various kinds of enforcement actions, pressured uh, financial companies uh, banks and uh, insurance companies to stop doing business at least as to certain things with the NRA. And that the reason for the pressure is they did not like the NRA's stance on guns. And uh, uh, so I represented the NRA on the petition. Uh, at the oral argument, we were represented by David Cole of the ACLU. It's a nice little ACLU NRA um, uh, 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 teamwork there. And the court unanimously, in an opinion by Justice Sotomayor, said if these facts were accurate, if, that would be 
a, a First Amendment violation because the government would be threatening retaliation against private companies for what? For uh, uh, the private companies cooperation with constitutionally protected speech, like the NRAs. So I, so I do th I think that uh, without question, uh, if the government, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, uh, threaten uh, uh, companies, and com uh, either companies with the retaliation or certainly company employees with the retaliation for their constitutionally protected speech, uh, that that uh, should be blocked by courts, and I think courts are prepared to block. In Murthy v. Missouri, the case that Alex was referring to, the court didn't really reach that question because it said the particular plaintiffs hadn't established that they had been sufficiently affected by this, as opposed to well, the NRA. And part of their the problem world. was, and this happens all the time in these cases, is the speech is actually still up, right? That you have all of these cases where people are complaining, I've been censored. I've been censored, I've been censored. And they, they say that in their tweet, in their video stream, in their YouTube. They're saying it in real time on Facebook Live, look how censored I am. Please like and subscribe and, and follow me on, and give me money on Patreon. So like, in this, specifically in this one, the people who said I had been censored, the content was still up. So, so and that was like a real, that's a real standing problem when right. it's like you actually haven't been harmed. Right? Well, right, although in many of these situations, some of the content remains. None of these censorship regimes, if they are such, are perfect. NRA is still in business, notwithstanding what Vula was doing. Uh, but there was interference, at least allegations of interference, with the distribution of certain material. That some of the material was taken down. Your First Amendment rights aren't just limited to, well, you've got some place you can speak, so, so there you can speak, and then we can restrict your speech based on content elsewhere. Uh, so the allegations in a lot of these cases is the censorship is imperfect, but there are elements of it. Right, but this is also because that case was specifically built for judge shopping, that they found people who lived in a specific district where there's only one judge where they could get the outcome they wanted. I am shocked, shocked that there's judge shopping going right. on in this legal system. Of which I am then being personally sued in that uh, same that's district. True. It's true. Um, oh. Because uh, by that same judge who keeps on losing in the Fifth Circuit in the Supreme Court. And he's in this, this case will, will eventually be dismissed by the Supreme Court, but it has so far cost Stanford over $2 million to defend us and will cost them several million dollars because we published academic research on the election and we published academic research on COVID disinformation. So that is also, I would say, the abridgment of free speech and the use of the government to abridge free speech rights is to try to punish academic research groups who dare to speak up about these issues through lawfare, through having right. billionaire donors give money Margaret. to then have lawfare against the people who dare to publish on these topics. Sorry. Uh, I, I actually have a question about uh, how much working. Yes. Um, if, if this is possible, how much of the the content moderated is what we would call core political speech under the First Amendment versus spam, porn? Is that that day is public? You break that for, down? Uh, okay. Yeah. So that that is written down. Um, all of the major platforms except now X. So since taking over, Mr. Musk has eliminated almost all transparency on content moderation. He has eliminated content moderation reports. He's also removed X from the Lumen database. So Mr. Musk no longer talks about what content he takes down because of government requests. He stopped doing that after he was asked to take down content by the Indian government. And people pointed out that he did so without objection. Um, uh, and so uh, instead of fighting the Indian government, he decided to get rid of the transparency. That was his solution to that problem. Um, but every other major social media platform publishes quarterly reports. So you can go to Facebook, transparency.fb.com, I believe it might be. Mm -hmm. um, but Google for like Facebook content moderation transparency report. And right. what they'll show is, uh, there's a big PDF, but what's better is you download an Excel spreadsheet and then you can search for all of it. But what you'll find is things like spam are in the m hundreds of millions or billions. And things like, you know, uh, the controversial things like mm -hmm. uh, you know, vaccine disinformation will be in the thousands or tens of thousands. So it'll be three, four, five orders of magnitude difference. And so that's why when you're inside the companies, there's this huge weird mismatch because 99.9% .9 of the conversation on the outside is about 0.001% of your decisions, right? And so that's the, that's the, weird, that's the weird mismatch. Mm -hmm. If, if you're interested in this area of like how hard these hard decisions are, there's a great article um, 
about one specific decision uh, kind of during the height of the Me Too movement, all about whether or not you're allowed to say men are scum on Facebook. Um, and it's all about, because it's like this weird corner case of if you're saying men are scum, is that hate speech? Is, and in what situations are you allowed to say men are scum? Can you say it to a specific man? What if you add a racial mod modifier? If you say this kind of men are scum, does that make it worse? Are you allowed to say women are scum? These are the kinds of things. And so the entire article is about a bunch of people at Facebook, um, like, and they let the reporter sit there and write it up, the discussion. And it's like a couple of hours to try to figure out what do we do about men are scum? And then what are all the, because what you have to do is. And what did they do? Um, they can't, what is normal at Facebook, you end up splitting the baby. And you're like, in some cases it's allowed, in some cases it's not. And so the, <laughs> the challenge here is then what you have to do is you have to come up with a decision that can then be applied first by your content moderation team and then eventually by algorithms, by, by effectively GPUs. Um, there's a weird situation in which all the people in this room basically have their uh, speech moderated by PlayStations, right? Like, it's just a weird historical quirk that, like, video game consoles end up with the, the investment in the GPU technology, and then NVIDIA and AMD invented all these new technologies that turned out to be also really useful with doing the same kind of math that now powers AI. Um, and so that, like, it's just this weird kind of quirk of computer science history. Um, and so... What they had to do is then come up with all the situations that contextually you're allowed to say it. So you're allowed to say men are scum like, as like a political statement, but you have to be really careful about saying it specifically in somebody's face. And to your point before about the common carrier, what you also see at these platforms is what we call different surfaces have very different. So a situation where if you're just talking one-on-one -on -one with a friend, which I think is the most equivalent to a phone, you're allowed to basically say anything as long as it's not a couple of things like child exploitation, right? You cannot send a illegal image to a friend on Facebook, Messenger. But you can have whatever political view you want, any anti-vax view you want. You can say anything else. But if you publish it out to hundreds of millions of people publicly, then the rules apply. And so that's the other thing with all of these different decisions is you have the contextual issues and then you have how does it apply to our dozen different surfaces. Right. Uh, Margaret, in your question before, I wondered if there was an implication that you were wondering whether all political opinions were getting through on social media, or is that just my interpretation of what you were saying? Well, it... It, it, it stays on. It stays on. Hello. Um, it actually springs back to a, a, a constitutional law class I was teaching years ago in which we were talking about Reno versus ACLU, the big first Supreme Court case on the internet and First Amendment, and, um, and I, I said, so, you know, you are the generation that knows the most, and so one, uh, about the content, and one student raised his hand and he said, it's mostly porn. And so, connected to this question, is, is this, when we talk about, in, on this panel, the condition of free speech, is core political speech of whatever viewpoint, um, reaching the same amount of people as spam and other, I mean, not spam, but other content. Oh, that's uh, not, Excuse me, not to chime in, but I think we're at the uh, Q&A okay. portion oh, of the session. Okay. We'll, we'll get good. there in just a second. I, I just want to finish this. Well, I would just say core political speech is a small minority of the, what most general purpose social, so first on general purpose social media platforms like Facebook, core political speech is a tiny fraction of what people right. talk about. So that's, that's one of the things that shocks people who are like, because the people who argue about core political speech are people who care about politics. Normal, normal people do not use Facebook for politics. They use it for sports, their kids, personal updates, stuff like that. Um, so yeah. That, that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, as John says, we are prepared to take questions. What is the procedure, John? I believe Nina and Sella are going to start, and then we'll go over to the side of the room. Oh, no problem. So if people have a question, they should raise their hands. We have one here uh, at the moment. Are those questions being moderated? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Are there any misconceptions 
that folks from other parts of the U.S. have about Silicon Valley? Concerning free speech, are there any misconceptions that folks from other parts in the U.S. have about Silicon Valley? And uh, any one of you are free to take that. Yeah, I know how I would answer that, but what I'm interested in is how you all would answer that. I mean, I've already said it, which is like the vast majority of speech decisions are non-political. Um, I would say there's like, everybody thinks people in Silicon Valley are super liberal. I think there's actually, it, there is a bias just based upon like how politics lay out in our country right now. By definition, almost everybody who works at these companies is educated, right? And so like, you know, if you just look at, if you're hiring people who are racially diverse and educated, how they're gonna lay out politically is not, but the, the teams try very, very, very hard to take domestic politics out of it. The other thing I forgot to say, 95% of the content in, the United, in, in Facebook is from outside the United States. So that is the other difference about this, right? 95% of Facebook's users are not American. So when, when you're trying to come up with these rules, you try to come up with rules that actually apply globally, and that's the incredible complexity here, is then you try to come up with the rules that you can fairly apply to every democracy in the world and then try to apply them in autocracies becomes this whole other different thing. And so that's one of the reasons why you try to take politics out of it because then like, how do I apply this in Turkey or India or Brazil becomes incredibly complicated. So, so Alex, I think that last point is such a tremendously important point. Uh, and it makes me wonder to what extent already platforms do this, and I know Google does in some measure, and to what extent they can and should do this. And that is, have different rules for different countries. Uh, among other things, look, if you're going to do business in Turkey, you, if you have assets in Turkey, if you have employees in Turkey, and the Turks say, when you, if you say things that are critical of Erdogan or critical of our government or supportive of the dissenters, we're going to throw your people in jail. It may very well be that faced with the option of either getting your people thrown in jail or pulling out of the market, or complying, the company will comply. But I would hope that would mean that wouldn't mean that we in America can't criticize Erdogan or can't criticize the king of Thailand, to give another example, right. or can't post Muhammad cartoons, to give another example. Um, so, uh, 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 or can't post things that are illegal under European rules but that are constitutionally protected under American rules. So to what extent are companies already trying to say, look, we're gonna try to geolocate as best we can, and, but we're gonna try to therefore take, avoid exporting either American speech protections to your country or importing your speech restrictions to us, and it could be with other, any other set of country. To what extent are they doing it? To what extent can they do more? Right, so what they, Generally, the rule, I can only obviously speak to Facebook. Generally, the rule is they will, they will respond, they will respond to court orders taking down content in democracies. When, if, if they feel like it is egregious, they will fight it. And then if they lose, they will respond positively, right? That the argument is it is better to be able to operate there than, and to be able to provide speech to everybody than it is to take it down, but they will only geoblock. They will not take down the content globally. Mm -hmm. They will not shut down the account overall. Um, unless it is for either like child safety or terrorism, mm -hmm. in those situations, generally you'll have a global right. standard for which then you take down the, the, the entire thing. Within autocracies, it becomes much harder. And then right now we have countries like India where you have that like difficult place where they're in the middle. Um, I, what they really resist is proactively enforcing those rules. Mm -hmm. And that is now, the very difficult place Europe is putting all the company, right. countries into with the Digital Services Act, because Europe is tired. The Europeans no longer want it to be, we had to send you 500 orders to take down what we consider illegal content in, that all of us would consider free speech. And so they want the, co the companies to proactively enforce. Right. And so this will be the, the huge fight over the next five years. Hugely important. Um, I, I think, I've been thinking of little word clouds uh, about your question about what other people think of Silicon Valley. So I'm just going to say these words, and I'm not, it's not my own opinion necessarily, but these are the kinds of things I hear, like stereotypes and viewpoints. Um, rich, entrepreneurial, inno innovators, insulated, male-dominated. I'll just give some things I've heard. 
that's interesting enough, and on this topic, most of the important people are women, interesting enough. Um, and I think a lot, because a lot of them are lawyers, and so it come, they come from a profession that is more balanced. And for whatever reason, you end up with a lot more women on the policy sides, and so you end up with these interesting conflicts between the male-dominated product teams and the more female-dominated policy teams that become like the internal politics become very complicated. But yeah, but the executives are still male dominated. And so that, like the, the, the gender politics become very interesting, yeah. Other questions? Nina, you have to speak volumes louder. No. I can, I'll repeat it. Well, yeah, you, that's a good you idea. You need a microphone to uh, be heard. I can, I, can, I can ask the next question. Uh, okay. Margaret, I think this the voice of God question is for ask. you. Can you expand on the wealth disparities and how it impacts free speech and misinformation in minority communities? Yes, so... It's on. It's on. Yeah, we can. I don't know why I can't hear it. It's always on. So the way that I conceptualize it really has to do with the bundle of rights. So I think a lot about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to vote. And the connection between the wealth disparities, and particularly people who don't have homes, but even a lot of people here who can't afford homes here, who otherwise, in other parts of the country certainly would, is that um, their lives are under so much stress that they may not vote. And if there are hurdles in the way to vote, that certainly affects things. They can't give money in response to all those texts and emails <laughs> that say, um, I need to win this election, send me some money. And I think that has an enormous influence as well. And it's something else I've noticed just teaching at a university in Silicon Valley is that um, the dreams of students, a new generation of students, do not include a strong sense of civics or the importance of freedom of expression. Now, maybe that's our fault as professors, but it is something that I've noticed in this generation, that there's just more distance from the notion that there should be free speech. That's a very troubling statement and a, and a, and a profound concern. Do you think it's more true in this region? Maybe there's no way to know. I uh, certainly have heard other people talk about it in cities, in, in the big cities around the country, et cetera. So I, I taught a, a little mini course um, at my university outside of the law school with uh, someone from communications and um, media. And, um, and our intention, I think it was called sparking civics uh, for a thriving democracy. We got four students. It could have been the professors who were the problem, but we got four students. They were wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. And what came out in part was a lack of what used to be called civic engagement. And I'm guilty of this because most of the time, I'm doing this. This is my buddy. This is my, and instead of civically engaging with each other, um, I think people, the default position for a lot of people is just to go online. Okay. Okay. Our, ne our next and last question is, can the panel address the assumption that one's right to free speech entitles one to a captive audience for that speech? Could you all hear that? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not sure who makes that assumption. As a, uh, I mean, except m maybe, maybe it's addressed to us as academics. Like, we're the only ones who really talk to a captive audience, right? Our students come into our classes, they've got to listen. But as a general matter, truly captive audiences, ones who have no, no uh, uh, opportunity not to listen, are, are really quite rare. Uh, occasionally, but it's a concept in labor law that sometimes their uh, employers say, please, you have to come and listen to this speech. And there are actually interesting limits on that. Uh, but as a general matter online, the one thing we're not usually is captive audiences. Can I make a quick guess about that? And then somebody can tell me if I'm wrong and it's about something else. When I heard that, I thought about what's happening on college campuses, college and university campuses, in terms of protest. And the basic... Um, conflict in many, in, in 
one of the conflicts in these circumstances is that there's freedom of speech to express a view that other people listening feel that they have the right to be free of because it is harassing, it is perceived as hateful. Is that the kind of question? And, and they're saying, I shouldn't have to be captive audience to your speech in a public space. It, it's an anonymous question, so we don't know who asked it, but I, I assume similar to you. Oh, okay. uh, so, I'm sorry, I hadn't thought that this was about the internet uh, just because of the, the topics, but Margaret, I think you are exactly right. right, and I think that must be it, and I think that actually uh, ex helps explain why it is that, uh, uh, that some people, I would guess many at the ACLU, for example, would be one of them, are worried about the slippery slope of concepts such as captive audience. Occasionally you have a genuinely captive audience, people who have to be there. There may actually be a, some at the protests. There are employees, right? Anybody who has to be there, like any security guard, has to listen to this. But really, much as actually many of the, I, I'm generally pro-Israeli. I don't support the message of the, uh, the uh, anti-Israel protests. And in fact, I think some of their, their tactics are just violations of rules about how you can't block buildings, you can't break into buildings, you can't camp out at the university and such. But in terms of their message, I think their message is clearly constitutionally protected. And the students aren't really a captive audience. They can walk by, they do walk by. Now it's true that they're aware that this offensive message is present and they may feel that that degrades their experience and the environment that they experience. But I think that's the nature of virtually any protest, right? Uh, any uh, uh, people who are not going along with a strike, who have to pass by a picket line every day, right. might be offended by this. They may say metaphorically we're captive to it because we have to see it twice a day, but that can't be the level of captivity that is sufficient to strip the, the strikers of their right to speak. Likewise, the, the mere fact that, they're going, that uh, some people passing by the encampment are going to see a speech that is sharply anti-Israel or they perceive perhaps correctly, perhaps not as anti-Semitic, can't, it seems to me, be enough uh, uh, to strip it of, of constitutional protection. And, and another relevant point here, it seems to me, is that many university leaders have belatedly recognized that it's probably not so wise for them to take official positions or unofficial mm -hmm. positions on some of these issues in dispute. Not just the Middle East, but energy issues, lots of things, because that could be, it seems to me, could be interpreted as an official opinion coming down from on high right. that, that people right. don't, don't want to be forced to listen to. Right, I wouldn't say it's a captive audience point, but I think you're absolutely right that many, many of the uh, um, university leaders like kind of tying themselves to the mast through we won't make comments things. Relating to an earlier point, I'm sure lots of phone company uh, people, if you call them up and say, are you upset that you're common carriers and that you're not allowed to block phone lines for evil political organizations? They would say, we're delighted because whenever somebody calls us up and says, well, what about these bad people? We could say, our hands are tied. Don't talk to us. Don't complain to us. But it's also the reason why I can't pick up my phone except from a person who I, you know, it's part. It's partly technical reasons. It's partly the common carrier issue is why phone spam is so bad, right? Because, like, because they have both a lack of responsibility, but also a lack right. of possibility of of making any intentional decision on spam. Right. So as I understand it, with regard to text messages, uh, there is no prohibition trying to block text messages. They're just bad at it. <laughs> right, they're just bad at it. Um, even th though that may be in part because they haven't been declared common carriers for that. Nonetheless, you could certainly have common carrier rules that say you can block uh, spam, just like there are exceptions to common carrier rules that they can block harassing phone calls. Right. Uh, uh, phone companies can. If I may, on, the attention, on, the, on this issue, to bring it back to the internet, I think this brings up a great point. There's, there's no such thing as a captive audience on the internet. What this is, brings up is the internet issues are not really about free speech. They're about attention, right? The battle on the internet is not to get your word out. It's to get people to pay attention to it. Every single possible viewpoint you could want to find is out there. Anything you want to say, you can say. 
but nobody's going to pay attention to it. And this is what the real battle is about. It's not to get your viewpoint out. It's to, it's to get followers and views. And you guys know this better than anybody up here because you've been living it your entire young adult lives of the like and subscribes, of the TikTok dances, of the manipulation. This is why, you know, a week ago, the Department of Justice had an indictment that the, the Russian government, for everything that happened in 2016, Russian interference in the US elections has become much larger and much more targeted. And it is because of the war in Ukraine. In 2016, there was no strategic purpose to Russia's disinformation attacks. And now they are in a stalemate in an actual war where Russian territory is being occupied by another country. And so they got caught spending $10 million paying Americans to tell other Americans that Ukraine is their enemy. They didn't do that because you can't find the speech out there that Ukraine's America's enemy. You can find that plenty of places. They paid those people because those people had followers, because they had attention. And so it's not about speech anymore. It's about attention. And that's something that none of these laws cover. Um, now, that, that was illegal because they're actually just straight up getting paid uh, by a foreign government. But for the most part, most of this foreign interference is not actually illegal in the United States. A lot of it is not illegal um, unless they, they violate some of these really specific laws. Um, and so that's one of the, my real fears going forward is that our, our framework for this just doesn't cover um, the kinds of issues, and we're, we're not, obviously we're not foreseen by the, the framers, but have not foreseen by any of the 20th century First Amendment scholarship that covers things like television stations and radio and such. Do we have time for one more question? Do we have one more question? Sorry. Yeah, well, do, here's, here's one. Do media outlets, including social media platforms, have an obligation to correct inaccurate speech even if it is perceived as restricting free speech? Okay, that's a big question that we're gonna give tiny answers to. So I, I think that uh, uh, putting up kind of responses and, and say, okay, we're not gonna block this, but here's our reaction, I think is entirely their First Amendment right. Uh, it's an interesting question to what extent it's an obligation. I mean, similar question, does a university pr uh, president have the obligation to correct false statements made or by faculty. Well, you know, <laughs> probably not the sort of thing I'd like to have happen, <laughs> even if I'm a university president, because then everybody will come and say, oh, that person was actually saying something that was misleading, yeah. or that was support for the Russians or the Chinese, or, or whatever else. Uh, but certainly they have the right to do that. Uh, yeah, so this has actually become one of the responses for these really controversial topics like vaccine disinformation or political disinformation. Instead of taking speech down is the platforms will put up either a really milk toast. So for the election now, what you'll, you're going to see in election season on a bunch of platforms is any, any discussion of like the election was stolen, you're going to see a panel that says, here are the election results. Read more about election security. And it's not going to make any specific thing. It'll just be like, here's a link to kind of a generic place. I think that does nothing. There are more specific kind of fact checks. The actual quantitative social science evidence of this is still coming out. But it turns out that this has a actually a mixed effect on audiences. For some people in the middle, it does help keep them from being fooled by, by stuff. But for, for extreme partisans, it makes them more likely to believe to believe that something is true. And so this has been proven both now, first, the first good research on this came out of India because WhatsApp was doing this um, around the Indian elections where they were doing fact checks. And it turns out people in India were becoming more radically supportive of the BJP when they were seeing these messages because they were seeing it as a foreign American company telling them what to think. Hmm. Um, and then it turned out here in the United States, there was just a paper a couple weeks ago um, showing that among extreme partisans uh, that this was making them more uh, extreme in their views. Well, and I guess I'm, I'm thinking about the, the word obligation. Mary, you need to use your microphone. Obligation. Uh, I mean, I would see it as an ethical obligation for egregious and far-ranging and dangerous uh, falsehoods. Um, but there is a right for people to lie. And unfortunately, it happens a lot in social media. I would say, though, this is a great example of there's a lot of assumptions and things like, oh, you can fix the algorithm, or you can do this, you can do that. And the truth is you have to test it, and you have to get actual real scientific results back before you can know. The assumptions that like you might have about how other people react on social media mm -hmm. turn out to be extremely untrue. That is, a, that is a lesson that people in Sil Silicon Valley have learned the hard way over and over again. When you have a relatively small, relatively non-diverse set of people designing products that are used by five billion people, all kinds of negative things happen. 
And the only way out of that turns out to be really careful scientific design and testing. Um, and that has to apply to all of these issues as well. Thank you. Thank you all very much for this, for this conversation. Thank you very much.